It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur from the CBS television news staff and August Hexer, chief editorial writer for the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Ernest A. Gross, former United States Ambassador to the United Nations and Assistant Secretary of State. From now on until next fall, when the United Nations Assembly meets and the congressional elections take place, this country will be faced by a continuing question. Can we keep Red China out of the United Nations? Now, our guest tonight has probably had more experience in fighting the battle of and against Red China's entry, and successfully, I may say, than any other man. So, Mr. Gross, we'd like to ask you, as our former ambassador to the United Nations, what do you think our present chances of keeping China out are at the moment? I feel very confident that uh, the Communist Chinese government will not win its seat in the United Nations, either in the General Assembly, when it uh, reconvenes, or in the Security Council. And I believe that uh, will be impossible because the great majority of the countries in the world, I think this applies to the Western European countries, to all of Latin America, now with uh, perhaps uh, no exceptions, uh, the uh, British Commonwealth and uh, several countries in Asia and several countries in the Middle East will uh, oppose the Chinese Communist uh, representation in the United Nations. But Mr. Gross, uh, for example, in 1950, before Korea, was there any comparable uh, united sentiment against the admission? It was not nearly as strong. The, uh, in the Security Council in 1950, before Korea, the uh, Chinese Communists came very, very close indeed to uh, uh, winning a seat uh, on the Security Council. There is no doubt that uh, in the General Assembly there was strong sentiment uh, in favor of uh, seating the Chinese Communists. Well, Mr. Gross, are we against uh, Red China's entry in, in the UN because she's an aggressor now or because we hope someday to overthrow her revolutionary government? The problem of uh, representation of a member state such as China is a different problem than the one of admitting a state into membership in the United Nations. It seems like a technical difference, but under the Charter of the United Nations, it's a very important you distinction. Mean, you mean China is already a member of the United China Nations? China is already a member of the United Nations. The question is, who is to represent China? Now, China now has a representative. In the Security Council, the representative is Dr. T.F. Tsiang, who is a very able and distinguished uh, one of the leaders of the, uh, uh, of the free world cause in the United Nations. He remains a representative, the representative of China, until he's replaced. In the General Assembly, the delegations of the nationalist Chinese government have uh, been very distinguished. Uh, they would be replaced by the communist Chinese if they won their seat. Well, Mr. Gross, when you were uh, our ambassador to the United Nations, you said that uh, the admission of uh, Red China to the United Nations or the ousting of nationalist China was not subject to the veto, but the present Secretary of State, Mr. Dulles, says it is subject to the veto. How do you explain that? In January of 1950, uh, on instructions from the government, I did uh, uh, announce that the position of the United States uh, government uh, was that we were opposed to the admission of Red China to the Security Council, but that we would accept a majority decision. You didn't say, therefore, that a veto was impossible. You said you didn't want to use the veto. Well, we, uh, we said that we would accept the decision. Actually, our position was based upon uh, a very simple and logical point. Uh, uh, the the uh, fact of the matter is that um, the Charter of the United Nations provides that procedural questions in the Security Council are not subject to the veto. Uh, the uh, question of who represents a member state is, or has been regarded as a procedural question. And it's a very simple, there's a very simple common sense reason why, because you see, if a permanent member of the Security Council, one of the so-called Big Five, uh, had the right to veto, uh, in the case of uh, who represented a government who was on the Security Council, then my good friend, Dr. T.F. Tsiang, I hope he stays on the Council for a long, long time. 
But uh, Dr. Tsiang, the nationalist Chinese representative, could veto his own replacement because he represents China. China is a permanent member of the Security Council, and uh, therefore there would be no chance of his being replaced. That the question of the United States using its veto would never arise. The Chinese no, was, could use the it Chinese themselves. Chinese would probably use it themselves. Well, does this mean, Mr. Gross, that if uh, Guatemala's new government uh, were on the Security Council, that Russia would veto it? Well, that's an interesting point, because if uh, Guatemala were a member of the Security Council and the communists, the Soviets, did not like the new government, they would veto uh, the replacement of the representative of the former government of Guatemala. So there are very practical reasons, therefore, why we should rely upon the straight uh, majority principle and not get into the complications which would be caused by, uh, by the application of the veto, which I think is unnecessary in any event. Well, nevertheless, in the uh, assembly, uh, what sort of a vote will be needed there to keep Red China out? Well, will under the, the uh, excuse me, majority of 31, a simple majority well, under or the two thirds. Charter uh, the, of the United Nations it provides that uh, the in the General Assembly votes on important questions have to be taken by a two-thirds majority. And of how, those do vote, how do you vote? How do you decide? decide yes, what is an important question? Well, <laughs> the uh, the uh, procedure is that the majority of the members of the assembly. Uh, decide whether or not it is important. If the majority decides it's imp uh, it is an important question, then it requires <coughs> a two-thirds vote to carry a proposition. I have no doubt that the problem of the representation of China would be regarded by a majority of the members as a, an important question and therefore would be subject to the two-thirds well, vote. Well, isn't all this discussion rather backwards? Wouldn't we first, wouldn't the vote come up on the ousting of Formosa of the nationalist Chinese government before Red China could be seated? Well, what happens in the General Assembly is that each time there's a session of the Assembly, uh, both rival candidates present their credentials, you see, so that the Credentials Committee, which is appointed each time the Assembly begins its session uh, once a year, uh, uh, that has to pass upon uh, which contestant, which competitor is entitled to uh, the seat for that government. Has Red China actually been doing that every... Red uh, China has been sending tele a telegraphic uh, communication. They've not been given visas to appear in person at the UN, UN headquarters, but they've been sending a cable uh, regularly and dutifully each time the General Assembly convenes and claiming the seat. Would well, you actually feel, or did you feel during your representation at the United Nations that, that Communist Russia actually wanted Red China to be a member of the UN. Well, I felt that while I was in the UN that uh, I could never read the mind of the Kremlin. Uh, I believe that uh, they have acted consistently as if they wanted the Red Chinese alongside them in the Security Council, and I believe that that's the case. I think it's kind of subtle to look for reasons Mr. why. Gross, yes. um, are, there, um, are there conditions which uh, can be laid down and made clear to the world on which we would admit uh, Red China at some future time? Is there some pattern of behavior to which it would have to conform? Well, it's important uh, to try to define the uh, reasoning there. Of course, the w our basic point must be that we should not support the admission of Red China to the UN unless, unless and until we consider it to be in our national interest to do so. Now, in the future, in the indefinite future, if we say that we shall never, under any circumstances, support Red China's admission to the UN, we are trying to outguess our own national interest. My own conviction is that uh, we should not support the admission of Red China to the United Nations until and unless we decide that our support of their admission to the UN is more likely to induce them to change their course of conduct and bring them into compliance with the standards of civilized behavior. And Mr. Dulles has said that the UN is not a reformatory, so letting them into the UN would not reform them. They have to purge themselves first. The UN uh, is not a reformatory, I quite agree. I think it's more like a hospital. <laughs> it's supposed to reflect the state of the world, as Mr. Dulles pointed out in his very excellent book written in 1950, War or Peace. And it is, of course, a, supposed to be, by design, a fair reflection of the divisions and tensions of the world. I do not not myself draw much of a distinction between communist China and communist Russia so far as bad behavior is concerned. Well, do you think, uh, Mr. Gross, that if some sort of agreement is reached in Indochina, as seems possible from the news we've had recently, that uh, the chances of Red China's entry into the United Nations will be better? Well, I think that there will be more pressure on the part of, um, uh, of uh, countries, uh, who some of whom are now, of course, uh, 
teetering on the edge of supporting communist China. Those countries which have recognized communist China, there are some 14 to 16, I'm not, I don't recall the exact number, uh, have not, uh, by and large, voted to admit Red China to the UN, to seat Red China. But it is true that uh, the closer the Chinese communists come in the future, if they come to compliance with the standards of international behavior, there will be pressures to seat them. Well, actually, if this pressure gets uh, very strong and it appears as, red, as though Red China will become a member of the United Nations, do you think we should withdraw? What would happen if the United States actually walked out of it? I just don't believe we will walk out of the United Nations. That would lead to a fragmentation of not of the United Nations, but of our national policy of solidifying the free world. We cannot possibly uh, um, break up the United Nations without reverting to the age-old balance of power, a principle and practice which has inevitably led to war. We have to do what has been called uh, develop a community of power. I don't think the United Nations is really working as well as it should. I think that the Russians have obstructed it from the beginning. But we must, it seems to me, persevere in the effort uh, to solidify the free world. And we can only do it through collective action. Thank you very much, Mr. Groves. We appreciate having you here tonight. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and August Hexher. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Ernest A. Gross, former United States Ambassador to the United Nations and Assistant Secretary of State. <laughs>